Poem number 67, I Died for Beauty But Was Scarce, by Emily Dickinson. There is a huge amount written on Emily Dickinson, on her life and on her poetry. Much of it is available via the internet. Harvard University in the United States has just launched an amazing new site that Mrs. McLennan, in her research, came across just the other day. And here is I Died for Beauty, written out by hand, of course, by Emily Dickinson. Quite amazing. What we take, however, what we select from all this information, what we emphasise, must only be what applies to belonging, the border studies area of study concept, and Emily Dickinson's own context, her time and place. To be great is to be misunderstood, said Ralph Waldo Emerson. Emerson was a very important influence on Emily Dickinson's thinking and values, thanks to a 26-year-old lawyer, Benjamin Newton, who gave her a collection of his poems, encouraged her poetic talent when she was just 16. And Dickinson was misunderstood. A highly individual, intelligent and creative woman, but extremely shy, living in a very patriarchal and conservative religious society in Amherst, Massachusetts. Here's a photo of her. That's her on the left, I think, attractive in a dark, sort of intense way. Dickinson is enjoying soaring popularity as a, good, as a poet today, a reviewer wrote recently. But in her time and place, because of the way she wrote poetry, because of the way people act, interacted socially, she made connections with very few, and mostly by writing. Perhaps with social media, if she had lived today, because you rarely get to meet your 1,100 Facebook friends, she would have felt less lonely. Her success as a poet wasn't helped either by a small, rather, a small-minded, rather dim-witted publisher, Tom Higginson, who tried to get her to change the way she wrote poetry. Fortunately, Dickinson politely ignored him. The Belonging Rubric and Poem 67. Aspects of belonging I think we should associate most closely with Dickinson. For each of these statements from the rubric, you need to have a clear understanding of how Dickinson illustrates them. Text may explore many aspects of belonging, including the potential of the individual to enrich or challenge a community or group. They may reflect the way attitudes to belonging are modified over time. Text may also represent choices not to belong or barriers which prevent belonging. In engaging with the text, a responder may experience and understand the possibilities presented by a sense of belonging to or exclusion from the text and the world it represents. This engagement may be influenced by the different ways perspectives are given voice in or are absent, that means silent, from a text. Perceptions and ideas of belonging in text can be constructed through a variety of language modes, forms, features and structures. And what the rest of this is asking, is the Board of Study uh, asking students asking students about aspects of belonging like assumptions, uh, choice, um, and your personal, um, how your personal understanding of belonging has been broadened by what you've studied. Let's get to the poem. <clears throat> I died for beauty, but was scarce. To die for something has multiple meanings or nuances. This is typical of Dickinson to embed paradox and ambiguity in her poetry. If you die for something, it means in the cause of and there is a sense of failure. He questions softly why I've failed. But to die for something can also mean to have shown the value of something by sacrificing yourself for that goal in the sense of martyring yourself. The early Christians during Roman times, or of Christ himself, who is said to have died for our sins. In these two lines, therefore, Dickinson is significantly broadening our understanding of her relationship with the world and other people, how she chooses to belong and what gives her her unusual identity. Even the use of scarce in the first line has multiple meanings. Dickinson's use of enjambment allows the word to sit at the end of the line and draw our focus so that it forms part of the meaning of this first line, suggesting rarity, scarcity. Because after all, few people are prepared to live and die for, for causes like poetry. Only poets, really. second meaning of scarce comes from the enjambment
from the enjambment too, because the meaning of scarce runs over to become, as well, part of the meaning of both lines, but was scarce adjusted to, in the tomb, which implies the speaker was not ready for what was about to happen, death or unity. Dickinson saw death in both a Calvinist way, as the great leveller, but also as the great unifying, unifier, a Unitarian, transcendentalist view of God's imminence in the world. Imminence is like inscape, God's presence in the world. God is God in everything. Here's a definition of scarce from the Webster's 1844 American Dictionary of the English Language that Dickinson famously kept on her desk as she wrote her poetry, also from this incredible Harvard website. You see that it meant, at the time, rarely, its meaning in the first line, and also hardly and barely its meaning if we include both lines. So in summary, Dickinson is em emphasising with both word choice and form, enjambment, her rarity, the extent of her individual choice and belonging, and its difficulty for her. <clears throat> of the eight poems selected for the HSC course on Dickinson, this is the one that, to me, is the embodiment of her relationship with the world what Elizabeth McMahon calls the paradoxical relationship or tension between longing and belonging that we see in Dickinson. And her desire to make poetry show us the way she sees the world. For instance, critics talk about her use of parallelism, the notion that she avoids a resolution of conflict tension. Typically, we like to see tensions resolved, happy endings, everything sorted in the end. We belong. With Dickens, however, the two speakers are referred to in parallel language, brethren and kinsmen, but they also lie alongside each other, communicating but not joining or merging. So the bizarre image of two bodies in separate but adjoining rooms is imagined by Dickinson to communicate her desire to remain an individual. Texts may also represent choices not to belong, but also for the individual to enrich or challenge a community or group. Again, Dickinson has used both the conceptual metaphor, conceptual approach, the visual metaphor of two figures lying side by side, not touching yet communicating, we talk between the rooms, and form parallelism like brethren and kinsmen to convey her perspective of belonging. Dickinson poetry is 80 years ahead of its time in this sense, moving conceptually into modernism where forms reflect less perfect worlds or actually, reality. In both her perspective on belonging and poetic form, Dickinson is modernist, and therefore highly individual, creating a significant barrier for herself while challenging her era and its liking for Victorian sentimentality. Characteristically, Dickinson adopts a male, male voice or persona. Truth, talking to beauty, refers to them as brethren, kinsmen, to evoke a masculine, rationalist, even scientific view of the world. Typically, Dickinson used, a, used the male voice to represent the hostile aspect of nature, such as a narrow fellow in the grass. And typ typically, she sets up the male voice in 67 in opposition to the female persona, personas which represent the ineffable or unfathomable, unfathomable elements in her relationship with the world, the unseen. Significantly, in this poem, the male voices are silenced as the moss reached our lips, their identity erased as the moss covered up their names. Dickinson, as she does in I Gave Myself to Him, is strongly challenging the dominant patriarchy and its thinking or ethos. Dickinson is ahead of her time. Her, her poems are full of bold, stark, vigorous images, like, much like William Carlos Williams, a famous modernist, a modernist writing 80 years later. The grass divides as with a comb, a spotted shaft is seen, she says in, a, in an arrow fellow in the grass. Her letters too are replete with saucy repostes or bold declarations of love. Master, if you saw a bullet hit a bird, she, she declares to a man for whom she has fallen. She's hardly the timid mouse or, or childlike portrait many critics purvey of her. Dickinson represents the way that attitudes to belonging in a relationship have been modified over time, especially in regards to women, and with which we in 2014 can identify strongly. Note how quickly the rhymes 
reflect this unsettling new vision of the world, how meaning is compressed and condensed into three four-line stanzas. In the first quatrain, a typical A, B, C, B is perfect, tomb and room. But by the second, it is going astray, merely slant or half-rhyme, replied and said. Half-rhyme is when only part of the word rhymes, either the consonants or the vowels. Here, the consonants rhyme. Finally, in the third stanza, the rhyme is quite disjunctive. Rooms and names are half rhyme, but the vowel difference is jarring. The protagonist and his fellow speaker, his fellow seeker of an absolute ideal, are terrifyingly being erased, losing their ident identity and, fo and voice until the moss had reached our lips and covered up our names. Death is real, not some romantic abstraction to be transcended. That is modernism in all its dark reality. Now to the difficult part. And this is important because you won't necessarily get more marks because you have a million techniques. If they fail to reflect a global understanding of the poems and Dickinson's relationship with the world and poetry. Too many techniques can't, can get in the way of a structural or conceptual al analysis. In this poem, <clears throat> Dickinson is drawing on two poems from one of the most romantic, important romantic poets, John Keats' Ode on a Grecian Urn and his Endymion. A reference to Keats' Ode on a Grecian Urn, Beauty is Truth, Truth, Beauty, that is all you know, ye know on earth and all you need to know, would seem to align her with romantic idealism about the power of art to attain immortality for man or specifically the poet. Typically, however, Dickinson conveys an antithetical and very individual view in representing the moss growing over the lips and names, symbolically, symbolically or metaphorically representing the silence of the poet's voice and the loss of his true identity. He doesn't achieve immortality. In, a, in another poem, A Word Drop Careless on a Page, she gives fuller expression to Roland Barthes' death of the author concept loading the poem with images of disease, infection, breeds, malaria, and neg negativity, despair, to accompany the words passed down in, prosperity and in posterity to a new reader. Dickinson's view of art sets her apart from her time and context, but perspectives of belonging, in this case to the literary establishment, can be modified over time, and Dickinson's popularity is soaring. She may not have felt she belonged alongside Keats, but major 20th century intellectuals like Bart and Sir Susan Sontag share her views today. Sontag says, Unfortunately, moral beauty in art, like physical beauty in a person, is extremely perishable. And this is, of course, what the point she makes in A Word Drop Careless in a Page. How we interpret the word 200 years later may be very different from how it was intended uh, by the author. The tone Dickinson adopts in I Died for Beauty to address the platonic concepts of beauty and truth is unconventional. It's unconventionally jovial, almost colloquial. We're scarce adjusted the tomb. We talk between the rooms. <clears throat> it shows a distinct lack of reverence for the great romantic poet's tribute to beautiful platonic forms, beauty and truth. And with this, all our assumptions about Dickinson, seeing her name, her identity, created by belonging alongside the great romantic Keats with his transcendent imagery are tossed aside. Until the moss had reached our lips and covered up our names. No, Dickinson's perspective on belonging and the art of poetry is real, earthly, grounded and perishable. Modernist. But there are also numerous paradoxes. Nature is living and eternal and unifying. Beauty and truth are joined in death like Bouchus and Philemon who, when they died, die alongside each other until many years later, in the middle of a conversation, they notice leaves springing forth from their bodies. They turn into a conjoined tree. You can see where she got the idea for the poem. Selina Samuels expresses it this way. In typical form, she, Dickinson, reverses the sense of unity and hope in the final lines of the poem, in which the identity of truth and beauty is erased. They are not, as Keats would have them, free from death, and rendered immortal in art, but eroded in death. All things are obliterated by moss, which is yet, which is in yet another reversal, the agent of nature. But perhaps Samuels does not see the value Dickinson places on the mystery of nature. Not 
in the rational and noble. We must allow then that she carves her own unique path, path to unification, to belonging with nature. Her debt to Ralph Waldo Emerson, the founder of the Transcendentalist Movement in America, is profound. To the extent that any and all of the following reflections by Emerson could serve as lit motifs in Dickinson's body of work. Do not go where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. Or to be yourself in a world that is constantly trying to make you something else is the greatest accomplishment. And finally, build therefore your own world.